Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hey, hello, and welcome to Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, where I am the actually the angry white male this week. I'm, that's my that's my role here at Think Tech Hawaii. No, actually. I'm here to, to talk about energy and thank some people from last week when we had uh, Renew Rebuild Hawaii. Had a great turnout, so thanks to Michael Markrich, uh, Hawaiian Electric, and all the folks that sponsor that, that great event. We had a good turnout. We had some hydrogen vehicles down the stairs and had a lot of good discussions. So thanks and uh, mahalo to the folks that put that together. It was a great forum. And uh, in those lines, I'm going to start off today with a, a quick video. I got this video from uh, University of California at Los Angeles, and it uh, talks about their hydrogen station. So we'll kick that off first before we get to our, our special guest today. Hello, and welcome to the Cal State LA Hydrogen Station. Opened in 2014, this station is the first station in the world to provide hydrogen to retail customers. A brainchild of Dr. James Ataro, this station was built to educate and encourage new strategies for alternative power sources. Thanks to the donors at California Air Resources Board and other donors, the hydrogen station is at an advantageous location close to downtown Los Angeles on the 710 and 10 highways. At the Cal State LA hydrogen station, we produce our own hydrogen. The process of creating hydrogen starts with city water, which is demineralized and sent to the electrolyzer. At the electrolyzer, the purified water mixes with an electrolyte. Then electricity is run through the solution to separate hydrogen and oxygen from H2O. The hydrogen is kept and stored for fueling and the oxygen is released into the atmosphere. The hydrogen is then sent to a low pressure compressor, which increases the pressure of the hydrogen from the initial pressure of 150 psi meaning pounds per square inch, to 6,200 PSI. For reference, the pressure in a car tire is around 32 PSI. For conversions, one bar is equal to 14.5 PSI, which is equal to 0.1 megapascals. After hydrogen is compressed, it is sent to the storage tanks to be stored for later use. There are three storage tanks which hold 20 kilograms in each tank. So in total, 60 kilograms of hydrogen can be stored on site. Once these tanks are full, the electrolyzer shuts off and waits for a fueling event. A typical hydrogen vehicle stores hydrogen at 10,000 PSI, which is a higher pressure than the hydrogen in the storage tanks. Hydrogen at higher pressures allows consumers to fuel more in their tank. Therefore, a second set of compressors are required, which are called hydropacks which increase hydrogen pressure from 6,200 psi to roughly 10,000 psi. After the hydrogen gas is compressed, it heats up, so hydrogen goes through a chiller in order to cool down, which also allows the hydrogen to be fueled at a faster rate without overheating the car tanks. A hydrogen dispenser is designed to be similar to CNG fueling and easier for the consumers. The dispenser nozzle is equipped with infrared technology, which communicates information such as the vehicle tank temperatures and pressures, which allow the system to monitor and plan fueling rate or stop fueling if there are any problems. Other precautions such as leak sensors, flame detectors, and leak tests are taken during fueling, making fueling completely safe. We hope that after this virtual tour of the station, you have learned a little more about the Cal State LA Hydrogen Station and that we will see you soon. If you'd like to learn more about the station, please visit our website. Hey, thanks to Dr. Blackman and the folks from Cal State LA for uh, putting that video together. I thought it was really great. It showed the inner workings of the station, and uh, just so happened the first day they actually sold any hydrogen from that station, I happened to be in California and visiting, and the price hasn't changed in two years, by the way. It was still $15 a kilogram then. 
And that's actually quite a bit. That would be the equivalent to about seven fifty a gallon for gas. But we find that most of the cost required is transportation. So they kind of, I don't want to say they're price fixing, but because they're hydrogen, they're trying to keep the hydrogen price fairly standard across all the different stations in California, they kind of set the price at $15 a kilogram. But that electrolysis station actually can produce it relatively inexpensively. If they had a nice big PV array, it'd be even better. So anyway, thanks to the Cal, uh, University of California folks for letting us use that video, and we'll show it again from time to time. Now we're going to get into what we're really here for, and that's to talk about gem. And um, that's not like in jewelry gem. I know that it'd be fun if we could get that kind of energy into the show, but no, the gem program that the um, Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism started about 2014-ish um, to try and encourage people to put more solar PV and other uh, energy, renewable energy um, equipment on their property, in their businesses, and things like that. At least that was the dream as they started. But I'm not an expert in it, so we brought an expert in, and I'd like to introduce Gwenya Mamoto Lau. Thanks for being here, and you're the you're the gem expert now. You're the gem <laughs> expert in, in the state. So thanks for being here and uh, and helping me explain to people, you know, what this program does, what it's out there for, and how we can start getting more people involved in it. Thank you, Stan. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on myself before okay, I get into, the, in, into that. I, I am a recovering banker. I've uh, been in um, banking for 30 years, okay. commercial banking, primarily in the commercial lending sector. Uh, I joined a community development financial institution mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago, started doing low-income housing tax credit uh, financing. We expanded to SBA small business um, lending, mm -hmm. and then we delved into the uh, energy lending side, and that's where I, I started getting my passion oh, in doing okay. the energy lending. Um, so I joined the authority, uh, Hawaii Green Infrastructure Authority, in 2016. Um, the program was launched, uh, constituted in 2014 with the issuance of the $150 million bond. Mm -hmm. um, it got off to a slow start, admittedly, it got off to a slow start. Mm -hmm. um, I took my this position as an executive director in January of 2017, last okay. year. I'm the fourth executive director for the program. It's quite a bit of turnover. <laughs> it's quite a bit of turnover. It's, it's been a, it's it's been a tough a ride yeah. um, for a number of reasons. Um, the, you're right, the, the purpose of it was to uh, facilitate solar, uh, PV, and uh, other clean energy infrastructure uh, to the general public, uh, but with a focus, 51% uh, of it, on the underserved, defined as low-moderate income households, renters and nonprofits. Can, can you kind of give the audience an idea of, you know, what advantage there is to a program like GEM compared to the legislature giving revenue, you know, out of the out of their budget to to do this stuff? I mean, you know, kind of what is, how does a bond work? I mean, it's an investment tool for people to invest in outside for their retirement of funds or whatever. A lot of, I mean, I have bonds um, that I have in a trust for my dad's estate and things like that. So kind of explain the idea of bonds and how, how that impacts the state or saves the state sure. from having to tap into revenue. Sure. So what DBIT did, um, so this this bill went through the legislature in 2013. And uh, DBIT was uh, very innovative and forward-looking in taking a rate reduction bond that utilities typically will use for stranded assets. Okay. Um, and they use, they use that same financing mechanism, the bond, and instead of using it to rescue stranded assets, they used it to capitalize a uh, clean energy loan fund. And that in itself was very innovative, very forward-looking. Uh, DBED won uh, recognition nationally and internationally because mm. of that. That was the first that was done. Um, the the really neat thing about the bond and the green infrastructure fee that was put on the utility is because it's a non-bypassable fee on the utility bill, it enabled the state to get the best rate possible. So the bond rate is uh, it's 15 years, and the rate is 2.99%. Mm -hmm. And it's because of the reduction of the risk, because of the non-bypassable green infrastructure fee, that the state was able to get such a good financing um, uh, so, for, so for the folks that are investing, 
and putting their money in on the money input side, is it a tax-free bond like a lot of the other state bond systems or no? You know, I'm not sure if it's uh, tax-free. Okay. Um, I do know, though, from a risk perspective as an investor, mm -hmm. it's it's the, low, the risk low is risk. low. Okay. And that's why the return is low, but the yeah. risk is low. Okay, right. all right. Yeah. So we have this bond, $150 million. That's a lot of That's a lot of money to work with. Um, and it's focused on helping people, like initially when solar was kind of ramping up, that's what it was intended to use mostly for solar, um, to ramp up. And, and um, then the solar market kind of went a little bit flat because of um, HECO kind of reaching a max. I mean, they can only take so much. Sure. That's, that's more the side I'm familiar with because, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with their duck curve and, and I know how much renewable is getting pushed into them. And although a lot of our statistics, the renewables are on the neighbor islands, um, Oahu's got a lot of solar. I mean, if you if you fly over in an airplane, you get a real eyeful of how many roofs actually have solar on them, and it's quite a few. Um, and for all that, HECO has a balancing, a grid balancing sure. problem. So, um, but so they had to slow down a little bit, and the market kind of slowed down. But ideally, we'd like to keep that market going, and we'd like to keep Jim involved in that in, in financing that. So, what does it look like in terms of? maybe including other renewable energies, wind or small wind or things like that in the GEMS program, is, it, is that even possible? So right now, so the program is um, overseen by the board of the Hawaii Green Infrastructure Authority and then also by the PUC. So we're okay. regulated by the PUC. Okay, so you are PUC regulated. Right, so um, whenever we want to finance something, whenever we want to come up with a new loan product, um, we need to go to the PEC for approval. Okay. Um, and so, right, so we, it started as solar PV. Um, we <clears throat> expanded to commercial energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, recently expanded to a residential energy efficiency for, for uh, solar hot water and heat pumps. Okay. Um, so, uh, while we're not uh, approved right now to do anything other than those things, mm -hmm. um, we would need to get, um, we would, we, if there was a will, we would go to the PC and ask for approval. Okay. And about how long does it take for that process, the PUC approval process for these? Does it vary or is it pretty consistent? Right, so good question. So on when the PUC approved our financing um, loan program, they included a list of what they called approved technology. That would be solar PV, commercial energy efficiency, um, battery storage. Mm -hmm. um, if it's on the approved list, we can then go back to the PC and ask for approval for specific loan programs or products. Mm -hmm. um, and they have a 15-day decision-making uh, process. Okay, so that's pretty quick if it's already on the list. Right. So how do we get things on the list? That's a whole different process. Right. Then, so, right? so if it's not on the list, um, then it would be a longer process. It's, it could okay. be a 45 day process or it could be longer depending on what it is. Mm -hmm. um, okay. For example, we are uh, approved to finance the uh, um, consumer on community solar when that is um, mm -hmm. launched, okay. when there's a solar farm there. We're not approved to finance the developer in a subscription model. Mm -hmm. um, so if there was a developer that needed um, assistance in financing, we would have to go to the PC um, and get approval. It, it, you know, it would, of course, a little bit longer. Okay. Who would normally start that process in terms of getting something on the list at the PUC? Is that something your office would do or the governor's office would do or the legislature would do or the or you know an individual could say hey I think this ought to be on the list and can an individual start it? Right so it would come through our office and it could be through an individual or a company that has a project that needs financing um, it could be through the governor's office, and then that which would go through the legislature. So okay. any of the above. Okay. Yes. Okay. I know you brought some slides, and I don't know. You want to jump sure. into those? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Hey, Robert, if we can pull up the first slide. So uh, um, we just launched on June 1st our uh, Green Energy Money Saver on-bill program. Um, and for those of you who have been involved in Hawaii's on-bill program, you'll know that this has been a very long journey. It started in 2011. And fortunately, the energy industry is a very resilient group. So the GEMS on-bill program was approved, and we're very excited about that. Um, we're super excited about the fact that this mechanism can address credit barriers, especially to the low-income population. 
operation. As you can see on the slide, th those are some of the, um, the, uh, the features of the program. And as almost half of our households in Hawaii rent, we designed this on-bill program to minimize landlord objections, to provide split incentives for landlords to install and own a solar system on behalf of their tenants, while enabling the tenants to em enjoy immediate day one savings on their utility bills. Yeah, that's kind of neat because you you had a you have a situation too where you have people who are renting and then landlords who have maybe get the benefit and the, the tenants don't, but it's a kind of a way to share it. It's a win win to, to share the benefit. Right. Okay, we got some more slides coming up, but I think we're gonna take a quick break here and we'll be back with Gwenda to look at the rest of the slides and she can explain the rest of the gem program. Hi, I'm Dave Stevens, the uh, host of Cyber Underground, uh, every Friday here at 1 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com. And then every episode is uploaded to the Cyber Underground, that library of shows that you can see of mine on youtube.com. And uh, I hope you'll join us here every Friday. We have some topical discussions about why security matters and what could scare the absolute bejesus out of you if you just try to watch my show all the way through. Hope to see you next time on the Cyber Underground. Stay safe. Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness-Mark, and every Monday at 1 o'clock, I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And at that program, we bring to you a whole range of new scientific results from the university, ranging from everything from exploring the solar system to looking at the Earth from space, going underwater, talking about earthquakes and volcanoes, and other things which have a direct relevance not only to Hawaii, but also to our economy. So please try and join me, one o'clock on a Monday afternoon for Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, and see you then. Hey, welcome back to Stan the Energy Man on mine and Gwen's lunch hour, because we're both state employees, so we have to do this on our <laughs> lunch hour, otherwise we get, have to take vacation time. So thanks for being, being here, Gwen, and, and we're talking gem. We're not talking gems like diamonds and rubies, we're talking gem like the real way to get financed for your uh, renewable energy program. So, um, I'll let you jump back into your slides, Glenn, and, and talk about uh, how the program works. Great. So uh, qualifying for the on-bill um, green energy money saver on-bill program is a simple two-step process. The first process would be to uh, uh, you know, let me step back. We're not doing traditional underwriting with uh, GEMS, with the on-bill program. We're doing non-traditional underwriting. So we are no longer pulling credit reports, and that's how we eliminate credit barriers. We're simply sending a request to either HECO, MECO, or HELCO, and asking if there was any disconnect notice within the last 12 months. If the answer is no, then the applicant is eligible to uh, apply for the program. Um, homeowners, um, Renters, small businesses, and nonprofits on all rate schedules except F, which is street lighting, are uh, may qualify for this program. Okay, next slide. The second step is to analyze the energy improvements, such as a solar hot water heater or solar PV pro, um, system that is being requested. Uh, the contractor must be a GEMS approved contractor, and if the energy improvement is a solar hot water heater, the contractor must also be a Hawaii Energy Clean Energy Ally. The on-bill program requires the proposed improvements to generate an estimated minimum 10% utility savings after installation. The savings must include the GEMS program charge, which will appear on the applicant's utility bill to repay the funds advanced to install the solar system. The reason why this is requirement is very important is, again, we're not doing traditional financing and underwriting, uh, and we're not un uh, analyzing the credit worthiness of the applicant. We're researching if the applicant has paid their utility bill for the last 12 months. If yes, and with the minimum 10% savings, this, the future utility bills is smaller than what they have paid in the past then we are confident that the applicant should be able to continue to make the utility uh, bill payments in the future. That's a good, good uh, process. So about how many of these uh, contractors are already approved to do installs? Is it a good number? I mean, folks have a, a good... A good selection so of, of yeah so we have 14 on our approved list okay. we're looking for more we had never focused on the solar hot water heating before because okay. this was just an approved uh, technology right. so we would like to get more solar hot water heating yeah so all the contractors out there they're doing solar hot water and so jump on that list and get some more customers That'd be great okay well the next slide Robert so a number of technologies were approved for GEMS financing for both the residential and the commercial installations. 
The loan term is based on the estimated useful life of the energy improvement, thus allowing us to stretch out the repayment longer to allow for more immediate savings. Additionally, we will be working closely with the Hawaii Energy, uh, with Hawaii Energy on energy efficiency installations, and we'll be offering the applicant an option to either use their Hawaii Energy rebates to decrease the cost of the energy improvement or to buy down the interest rate. Okay. So yeah, for a lot of folks, um, a lot when it comes to the energy efficiency, the Hawaii Energy folks, there's uh, there's like fifty dollars here, hundred dollars there when it comes to installing or purchasing certain equipment. So they can actually, instead of uh, taking that as a cash thing, they can apply it towards their payments and reduce their bills. Right. For example, if it's a solar hot water heater and the cost is $6,500, the rebate is $500. They could either use it to lower the cost to $6,000 mm -hmm. or let us use it as part of a interest rate buy-down. Okay. And the reason we're doing that is not because we're trying to do an interest rate buy-down necessarily. We are. But what we're trying to do is I would like to invite uh, private capital because we like to leverage our funds, public mm -hmm. funds, with private private funds. Um, and this is a non-traditional underwriting. So mm -hmm. what I'm trying to do is build a loan loss reserve so that when we invite private capital in, there are um, mit uh, risk mitigators to make them feel more comfortable. Because okay. again, we're not pulling credit reports, we're not mm -hmm. doing any of that underwriting. They have to get used to that. This is non-traditional. Okay. But it's still a relatively low, low risk investment for our investors also. Right. Okay. I think you have one more slide. Yes. Yeah. So this is an example of a family of four on Oahu who will be installing a solar hot water heater, heater using the on-bill program. Their pre-retrofit energy bill is $218 a month. They will be using their Hawaii energy rebate to buy down their interest rate to 4.5% fixed for 20 years. Their post-installation energy bill is estimated to be $140, and their GEMS program charge, which is being used to repay the cost of the solar hot water heater, is uh, estimated to be $43 a month. So their total post-retrofit uh, energy bill is estimated to be $183 per month, which is a $35 per month savings, or 16.2% savings. So again, we're looking for a minimum 10% savings to qualify. This will definitely qualify at 16.2%. And in addition to the uh, estimated immediate uh, projected uh, utility bill savings, as the homeowner, they will also benefit from the solar tax credits for an estimated total benefits in excess of $12,000. So this is like the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. So that's over how many years again? The twelve thousand six hundred. That's how, what's the average loan? So it's for twenty years 20 because years, that's, yeah. the, that's the estimated that's use for life of pretty the, the system. So you drop your utility bill by it looks like um, twenty, thirty, thirty-five, know, 30, 35 bucks, mm -hmm. and uh, and that keeps going forward. I mean, no right. matter even if the utilities go up, the the cost stays the, low because they're reducing either yeah. reducing their consumption. Right. Right. Yeah. So and this is. Um, and this, and they're not out of pocket from the from they're, the very beginning. Day they're one, no not money a, down up no, front. No money down. They, it's a six thousand five hundred dollar installation, which they uh, reap uh, over twelve thousand mm. dollars in benefits over the life of the system. And so, when they install the system, uh, is, is there like something with the contractor where there's a warranty on the system? And right, we require warranties, um, workmanship warranty, and manufacturer warranties. Okay. All right, and those warranties are standard how, for how long? Um, so for solar PV, it's 20-year warranty. Oh, so it matches with the loan then? Right. Okay, right. that's perfect. Yes. That's perfect. And so. But we encourage the, um, the homeowner to, you know, do their due diligence. So look at the approved list, but do the due diligence mm -hmm. on which contractor that they want. Okay. Well, that's really good. And what are some of the, we've kind of taken a walk through the program. What's the future look like for um, maybe expanding your program, expanding the, um, the things on the list that we can use the GEMS program to fund, uh, and maybe even expanding to other areas uh, or, or doing this in other areas like um, uh, maybe agriculture or something like that, similar model. Right. Um, you know, what's, what is the future? So I'm going to take off my executive director hat now, and I'm going to talk as Quinn. As a banker, <laughs> a recovered banker. As a recovering banker. Um, so 
I think the purpose of, of the GEMS funds certainly is to help the underserved who has not been able to uh, adopt solar or clean energy in the past. Um, that's certainly a, a, a purpose of the GEMS funds. I also think, and this is just my personal opinion, that um, we should be using our financing to uh, jumpstart new technologies mm -hmm. that is not quite um, accepted by the conventional lenders. You know, once the the uh, the GEMS is not for everyone. If they can get a loan from a bank or credit union, they should get a loan from the bank or credit union. Mm -hmm. We're there for those who are, are struggling Having to get a, a loan. Right, both on the commercial and the uh, the consumer side. Mm -hmm. Similarly, um, you know, I remember back in 2011 um, when uh, solar PV financing was a new thing to lenders, and so uh, I was at the CDFI at that time, and we used our funds to create a loan loss reserve fund to help mitigate the risks for uh, banks and credit unions, and they, then they started getting comfortable doing mm -hmm. solar PV lending, and then now they do their own solar PV lending. So similarly, uh, I personally believe that part of our fund should be used to jumpstart uh, new technologies that people aren't quite comfortable with until we can get the private capital uh, okay. market comfortable with the financing. Okay. So that would be other technologies outside Please. of so could it be applied to some new businesses that are using new technologies? I mean, I know we're getting way outside the scope of just GEM itself, but I mean, is this technique something that the rest of the state could look at? Because it does, I mean, whenever you start into something new, and I, I've run into this with the hydrogen stuff, everybody wants the state to dump a bunch of money into it, to get it kick-started, to, to overcome that, that first inertia and get things moving. Um, the state of California, in, in, in my area, in hydrogen, they, they put $100 million a year, every year, into the infrastructure. And Hawaii can't do that. Right. We just can't do it. So there's a program like GEMS. Um, is, is that something that we should be looking at? Maybe, like I say, maybe in the agriculture sector, sector or other tech sectors where we can be applying tech to improve um, production or, and, right. and grow our own food, things like that. Are there programs you, you see maybe coming up in parallel with GEM in the Department of Ag or things yeah, like that? Yeah, I'm not too familiar with what the Department of Ag is doing, but I would say that um, to me the underlying um, uh, mechanism under what GEMS should be doing, could be doing, um, is if we need to finance things that has a repayment mechanism, ability to repay, mm -hmm. and the part of that is it gets repaid, and that same dollar gets reinvested in another project, and another project, and another project. Um, that's how it becomes more sustainable for the state and everybody else. Uh, as an example, the legislature uh, passed a bill this past uh, session, I think it's on the governor's uh, desk for signature, to convert $50 million of the GEMS fund into an energy efficiency uh, revolving loan fund for state agencies. Oh, okay. And so that allows, similarly, allows the state agencies to borrow to do their uh, energy efficiency retrofits. They are going to reduce the consumption. Their savings there on your go. utility bill will repay Pays our loan. loan. They pay us back. We loan it out to another state agency okay. to do more uh, energy okay. retrofits. So similarly, if we can look for um, uh, situations like that where it can be re um, reused and reinvested, um, that same dollar so that every year the legislature doesn't have to come up with new money for that, mm. I think that would be ideal. Great. Well, it seems like we got the right executive director in there for now, and uh, and I wish you good luck with the program and uh, anything that we can do to help. And you want to come back on the show and uh, and talk about uh, changes and improvements and uh, advertise for more contractors or whatever. <laughs> we're, you're welcome to come back. But thank you, yeah, we're right up against our, our 30 minutes here, and I want to thank you for coming by. Thank you appreciate so much. It. Appreciate it. Go D bed. You know? <laughs> So thanks for being with us on Standard Energy Man this week. Uh, it was an all D-bed show, and uh, we'll uh, have you back next week and talk about some more energy stuff. Aloha.